AA Beyond Belief is a podcast by, for, and about people who have found a secular path to sobriety in Alcoholics Anonymous. About a year ago, in episode 137, I was speaking with Kim L. from Boise, Idaho. She is the co-founder of what I believe to be the first ever secular Al-Anon group, and uh, she updated us on how the group got started and how things were going in those early days. Well, now that it's been a year later, I thought it'd be nice to catch up with them to see how things are going today, especially in the age of COVID. So today's guest is Chia, another co-founder of the group Secular Al-Anon Boise. Welcome to AA Beyond Belief, Chia. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. Things are going famously thanks to you and COVID. We now have three online meetings per week and one in-person meeting in Ohio. And when I say we, I mean uh, secular al have these. And that's a, a lot of the... Credit for that goes to this website and your interview with Kim. A lot of people have found this that way. Well, you know, I get emails occasionally. In fact, I just got one last week from someone wanting to know if there are any secular Al-Anon meetings. And I only know a couple of people to forward those emails to, but they always get back with them. And I suppose right now that most Al-Anon meetings are taking place online anyway because of uh, the health crisis. Yeah, I, I haven't tried to track regular Al-Anon. As you know, they don't list our meeting because we have secular in the name. I did not it, know. I thought they got over that. No, we found a name that they would accept and submitted an application, but then COVID hit and we never heard back. I don't I, I, I don't know if they're even in the office these days. Anyway, the, it's hard. It's going to be hard for them to get over it because it's not a couple people. It's not one person thinking, "Oh no, we can't list people with secular in the name." It's the convention, the worldwide conference, who gives those directives to WSO, the World Service Organization, and so they're just implementing what they've been given. See, that's one big difference with um, Al-Anon and AA from what I understand is that like our general service office doesn't dictate to the groups or to the uh, inner groups as far as what they can do as far as listing individual groups and so forth. It's always done at the the lower levels. It's always done at the inner group level, the group level, all those decisions. I don't know whether they're dictating or not, but they're definitely refusing to list us in their worldwide listing. If you don't mind, let's let's start with a little bit of background. Um, let's let's talk about for. I, I'm sure that people listening to this podcast know what Al-Anon is, but let's talk about let's talk about Al-Anon itself. What Al-Anon is, a little bit of background of that, and then this, the the challenges that people with a secular worldview might face in Al-Anon. Great. So the requirement for membership is that there be a problem of alcoholism in a friend or relative. And the assumption is that under such conditions, we tend to adopt counterproductive strategies, that what's intuitive when dealing with an alcohol can be exactly the wrong thing. And I know this with my husband. What I thought was loving and helpful to do actually was keeping him stuck. He got into recovery almost as soon as I left him, which was a real eye-opener to me. So even though we define it in terms of someone else's drinking, really, membership is about being someone who uses counterproductive strategies or ineffective strategies, and that can be because we grew up with alcoholics or grew up in a dysfunctional home. It can be for a lot of different reasons. I have never had a practicing drunk in my life while I've been in Al-Anon because I had left my husband by the time I joined. But I have stayed because I didn't know what I needed. I didn't know how to get it. I didn't have the courage. I, I was 
I had been trained not to ask for what I wanted, and so I expected people to read my mind because it was too scary to ask. These are fairly typical Al-Anon issues. We come in thinking that the problem is someone else, and we stick around when we find out that the problem is us, and that if we want to stop being at the effect of other people, it's up to us to stop. We can't change everyone in the world. So that's what Al-Anon is about. There are plenty of people who qualify. Let me just point out that everyone in AA qualifies, qualifies don't we? <laughs> <laughs> and as soon as you start sponsoring people, you are qualify. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I've um, known a lot of people since I've been in AA who've joined Al-Anon, and a lot of them tell me they get more out of that than they do AA. Well, sure. I mean, I've been, uh, I'm in both. I've been sober 37 years. Drinking has not been an issue for me in a very long time. But dealing with people is an issue for me every day and will be till the day I die. So um, plenty of people need it. We are trying to make it available to the people who will not go if it's held in a church if they hear the word God, I mean, some people just break out in hives when they hear the word God, but they, they would check us out. And it's really exciting to me when those people have shown up in our meetings at their first or second Al-Anon meeting and stuck around and said later, you know, I, I wasn't going to be able to stay in regular Al-Anon, because what it's effectively asking, or it feels this way to me, it's asking you to be dishonest. If you don't believe in God and you say, well, you know, this is what I believe, and people say, well, just, you know, just act as if, I mean, to me that sounds like be dishonest. So, um so the people with enough integrity to leave, leave, and to my mind, that's a travesty. That w- we need to make recovery available to everyone who wants it. Well, you know, I've certainly over the years have gotten several, anyway, emails from people asking about a secular Al-Anon meetings, and uh, very, you know, and I usually will I will refer them to you guys in Boise or the group in Kansas, which were the only only groups that I know of, you know, um, and you guys have always been good about responding to people, but yeah, it's like, so obviously there's, uh, I, I mean, the same thing is true in AA and it's probably more true now than it was years ago. I mean, there's a, probably a larger group of people who, you know, who don't really have strong religious views and are a little bit bothered that it would even be part of their recovery anyway. I, I hear that when you check the boxes, none is the fastest growing religious preference. Yeah. Yeah, I think it is, you know, um, but um, I know that AA had problems with um, getting secular AA meetings kind of in the in the I'm accepted, I guess, by the greater fellowship. But I think we're pretty much to a large extent there now. What kind of let's let's go back to the specific problems someone might have, like if you're if you're working the Al-Anon program and you're an atheist, for example, what obstacles would you be facing? I think people stumble a lot over the word higher power. They, well, first let me let me say that our disease, the Al-Anon disease, is thinking that other people have the power. My life is messed up because someone else has the power to mess up my life. We give away our power. And we do this when we let Christians define our terms for us. When we hear the word higher power and we think God, we're doing, you know, we're, we're doing Christian evangelical work for them. It says power. It doesn't say deity. It doesn't say being. It says power. There are powers all over the place. So that concept is the first stumbling block, I think. And there's a, an awful lot in Al-Anon of let go and let God, and you take away the God, and you just let go. And people stumble over that. They're afraid. They're afraid their loved one's going to die. They feel like they ought to be doing something. And where do they turn for help? That's probably the next stumbling block, even if they can find 
a power for themselves, they have trouble with the guilt, the idea that they, so, so we have a little saying that goes, I didn't cause it, I can't control it, and I can't cure it. And, and, and we have that saying because people come in feeling like I did something, I need to do something different for this other person. Well, I, I need to do something for my, different for myself that may or not may not help the other person and and to be able to summon the compassion to watch someone suffer in their alcoholism is it, it's not a that's not a trivial challenge so uh you know so maybe believers can can say oh well it's in god's hands and that helps them and atheists don't have that. They have to marshal that resource in some other way. Yeah. My mother-in-law is an Al-Anon. Her um, daughter, um, unfortunately, is not in recovery and has, well, we've already lost, we lost her, her, her son-in-law we've lost. And now her daughter is not in good shape. But Al-Anon has been extremely helpful to her. She um, She's a religious person, but when she talks to me about, Al-Anon and what she likes about it. It's her friends. It's the community of people that are helping her and she just loves it, you know? And so, um, you know, we never really get into the details of what she, of her belief system or anything like that, but I always hear that. And that's, and that I've always thought that was the strength of AA too. And I've only experienced one Al-Anon meeting myself. And that was, uh, a 12 step call that I made. I've told this story before, but anyway, it was a 12 step call that I made and the, the alcoholic was not receptive at all. And his wife was there and it was obvious that she was um, abused and beaten and, and she wasn't really acknowledging that, but somehow she was willing to go to an Al-Anon meeting. And I don't know how I got to be the person to take her there, but I did. I took her to an Al-Anon meeting and Oh boy. You could just tell, I mean, the people in the room, they knew where she was at. I mean, you could just tell. And she, she was, she was shattered. Um, but there was so much love and concern and care for her. It just, it just blew me away. It was the most incredible thing I've ever seen. I don't know if she ever went back, but that was an experience I'll never forget in my life. And I don't know. I'm just kind of, I'm just kind of bringing that up, but it's just, there's a lot of power in that, in that in that community, that group of people who care, and it's a shame that something like um, a religious idea or terminology could cut some people off from that. And as far as I'm concerned, the great, the best thing that we could do in AA or Al-Anon or any any twelve step organization is try to become more inclusive and more open and break down any barriers of entry. You know, I completely agree. It's ironic, you know, you say you felt such love and concern and care. Well, those are the powers that propel my recovery. I don't need all power to recover. I don't it doesn't matter to me what pushes the stars around in the sky. That doesn't not relevant to but people's honesty in meetings is is part of my higher power. The time, their generosity, the time they will spend with me is part of my higher power. And so those people in the meeting were manifesting the power that I see as propelling um, recovery at the same time saying, oh, no, it's not me. Right, right. No, same here. Same here. And uh, it was, uh, and you know, I've, I've, I've always felt that in AA, too. I've always felt that um, it was the other people in the room that were giving me hope. You know, I could see that these people, I knew that they'd been through what I've been through. And yet they, they look like they're okay today. And I just, just knowing that was like, it was giving me hope that maybe one day I could be okay too. You know, thinking about that experience though, when I was in that room and I could feel the compassion, I could see the compassion on people's faces. Now that we don't really get to, we don't really get to experience that so much with COVID. How has COVID and moving online um, affected your group in particular and recovery in Al-Anon? Well, for us, it's been a real boon. When everyone was looking at paper schedules and we were not there, we were se severely at a disadvantage. Now everyone's going online. They're finding us. 
And uh, so as you've noted, all across the U.S. and Canada, people are linking in to this community. There have always been people trying to start secular Al-Anon meetings, and mostly they just fizzled for lack of um, being able to get a, a critical mass going. Well, w- on a Wednesday night in the what's still called Boise Secular Al-Anon, but really is just Wednesday night Secular Al-Anon, there might be me and Kim from Boise and the other 12, 15 participants are from all over the U.S. and Canada. So COVID has ironically been a great boon to us. And and this way we are getting, uh, a, a, I, I think we, we now have the critical mass. I don't think we'll disappear again as groups have in the past. They've tried and failed and tried and failed. I think that we, well, Boise, the Wednesday night meeting will will stay online, regardless of what happens with COVID, will remain. I don't think there's any compassion shortage because of COVID. I mean, you can't you can't cuddle. That's about right, it. right, right, right. We didn't we didn't do that much of that right. anyway. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, the, I've seen the same thing with the secular AA meetings. Um, now more because of COVID and these meetings being online, I bet you that we actually have more secular AA meetings than we ever had, and more and more people from just average AA people from any any group in the in in the world will find a secular meeting and find out that they like it and uh, most of the groups my group included will continue with an online component even after we all go back to meeting in person so there will always be these um online meetings along with the face-to-face meetings and hybrid meetings as well yeah so i think that i think in a way that this has been a boon to secular recovery resources in general because it's like you know now people can find find us you know they i wonder if you if a lot of people are finding you from your website too usually they find the website via one of the aa websites okay okay oh that's right either either yours or um a agnostica yeah yeah that's right that's right oh yeah they and that site gets a tremendous amount of visits so that would be really helpful and, and that, that's amazing, too, that you can um, – I mean, I wasn't like – when we started our group, we didn't really have any problems here in, in KC, but I wasn't concerned, like, if our central office decided not to list us because I knew that um, Google would help people find us anyway. Yeah, I think that – I think al is just behind that development, but, you know, maybe 20 years or so. The, the people who who have come far enough to say, you know – this is not working for me, are, are very thinly distributed. I think there's a lot of us out there. And in fact, personally, I consider secular meetings to be the future. I don't see any reason. The, the idea of God is helpful to a lot of people. Well, great. There's a lot of helpful ideas out there. You can sit in a meeting and swap helpful ideas all day long. You don't need to put it in your format. You don't need to ask people to pray. So th- this is the way things should be. To my mind, it's the future, and I think it's going to happen regardless of who drags what feet. Yeah, yeah. I I kind of I kind of see that too. I kind of see like history is marching along, you know, and 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 uh, and change happens, and it's happening at a pretty quick pace right now because of uh, how we're all having to to go to meetings anyway. Because we don't have anything else to do. I know we don't. <laughs> I'm home. I'm home like all the time. <laughs> so it's like uh, uh, I say, you know, I, I do work from home, and so the, I was going to a lot of online meetings, but I've gotten so busy with just the AA Beyond Belief website and just the community online that I don't really go to that many meetings anymore. It's all pretty much AA Beyond Belief has become my meeting in a sense, the podcast and so uh, forth. Well, it's service, so it. It's a lot the same way for me is that when I go to meetings, what I get from them is incidental. My main reason for going is to give back because I've been doing this, as I say, 37 years. I've been in these two programs and my I have a really good life. I, I, I don't go to meetings and sit in the back and cry through it the way I did at the beginning. So I think that people 
don't quite realize how important it is, how, um, well, for me, how important it is for me to give back, to know that what I've worked so hard to get, that that I can help other people get that, and maybe they won't have to work as hard or suffer as long as I did. That's that's more rewarding to me. If people understood that, they would call me more. <laughs> <laughs> they think they're, they're afraid about bothering me. What are they going to bother me in the middle of? <laughs> no, I agree. And I mean, I, I'm glad that there are people like you that do stick around. Uh, because when I, when I when I was coming to meetings, it was those people. They didn't even have to say anything. It was just having them in the room and knowing that they got their lives together meant everything to me. I mean, if if all we were were the people that were all just struggling all the time, it would not you know, wouldn't it'd be a little bit more difficult, I think. But for me, Chia, I um I get a lot of satisfaction out of watching other people, um, especially people that are starting out at the age I was when I was starting out. And I see them doing the things that I was doing when I was young. And um but you know, I just and it just makes me feel so good to see that I got to play a little bit of part in that, I guess. And that, you know, when I would leave, I've I've mentioned this before on different podcast episodes, but when I would leave a meeting in my home home group and I would see the people gathered outside smoking cigarettes and they shouldn't be smoking cigarettes, but they would always go out with each other after the meeting. I would just always feel so good about that because I remember that being so important to me when I was in my 20s and 30s first getting sober. Just little things like that just adds value to my life it makes it makes it makes me um i don't know it just adds something special that i would be missing if i didn't didn't have that yeah and to see i mean you can see in one meeting you're talking about the fourth step and you say to someone no of course you didn't your piece of the action isn't that you caused that person to abuse you no your piece of the action is that you haven't yet figured out how to protect yourself from abuse. And and then you get to the seventh step and the atheists are wringing their hands going, but I don't pray. And you say, well, well, but it's not about prayer. It's about being receptive to new ways of doing things. And you can just see their face change. By the end of their the meeting, they're not fretting. They, they see the possibility of going forward. And that's just way exciting. Those steps, by the way, six and seven, those are two of the most um, powerful steps when you when you take God out, aren't they? Because that's where you really have to develop your own willingness to change and actually make the effort to change. You know, it's not like God does it all. You know, if you, if that was it, it's not much to it. <laughs> you know, they they really get short shrift in the big book. They do, and. And in meetings, it's what I call blue smoke and mirrors. I don't know how it was just was lifted. Well, that really doesn't help me. But what has helped me, you know, is understanding that the sixth step, I am willing long before I'm ready. Ready means, well, well, to talk about uh, my alcoholic husband for a minute here, you know, I left him because I was not getting what I needed in the relationship. And it wasn't until I got to Al-Anon that I learned that if I wanted to get what I needed, I I was going to have to ask for it. Well, that was really scary to me because I had been trained growing up. I was punished for knowing what I needed and asking for it. So for me, I, I was willing to have that fear of saying no removed but to be ready was completely different. I had a mountain of fear to work my way through. And that is step six, becoming ready to say no when I mean no and ask for what I need in words. That's sort of a trivial step seven, but to be for me to be ready to do that, I mean, the first time I said no, when someone offered me a hug at the end of the meeting, I didn't want it. I said no the first time. I walked home. I was looking back over my shoulder to see if they were going to follow me and beat me up. It's, step six is not trivial. It's all of psychotherapy belongs to step six. And you get through your emotional obstacles, and now 
you can step seven you're you're like okay i didn't learn the answers are not inside me at this time okay universe where are the answers and you start asking your friends you start opening your eyes i mean people were showing me i could go into work on any day and see a demonstration of how to ask for what you need, but I did, I couldn't see it until I uh, made myself receptive, until I got to step seven and was asking the questions, how do I do this? And then I looked around and I go, oh, that's how you do it. I see. That's how it's done. That's what step seven is. It's the freedom step. It's where I become liberated from the the emotional chains that have had me miserable i mean i was miserable when i got to on uh so yeah i i agree clear away the blue smoke and mirrors and and let's talk about nuts and bolts yeah those are uh two of my most favorite and most interesting steps to talk about if i talk about a step on a podcast those are uh, especially this one those are those are the ones that really where it really gets interesting you know when people talk about um especially when when um you know they define you know what what we i don't know if in alanon they probably do call them character defects too do you use that term yeah yeah and um i learned from somebody when i did a podcast here that they saw them not as character defects, but as defense mechanisms that they learned to use that were that stopped working and that were harmful. And I just found that a real interesting way of lo- of looking at at them. And she just kind of gave me a whole new perspective on what is typically defined as character defects. So I pretty much understand my step four as being about outdated strategies. Growing up in that dysfunctional home, I adopted strategies that were the best I could do there that are totally the wrong thing now. And my piece of the action is not that I grew up in a dysfunctional home. It's that I I, I need to update. I haven't updated my strategies. So, yeah, defects, defects is the word that a bunch of <laughs> Um, privileged white men use to help them control their own egos. And, you know, most people in Al-Anon are not privileged white men. They tend to be like like the woman that you 12-stepped who are beaten down and the last thing they need to do is a fruitless, searing moral inventory. Oh I know. I know. Oh, man. That happens in AA too sometimes as well, but yeah, absolutely, yeah, that would have been that that would not have been helpful for her at all. So, so anyway, it's good to hear that your group is doing well. Um, you've been how long have you all been meeting now? Well, we started meeting in person back in July, uh, not this past, so a year and a half ago. A year and a half ago, okay. Yeah, and we were dying when COVID hit. I mean, it was. It was going to be hard to keep going because we were not listed and people were not finding us. So we went to Zoom and right away. Isn't that amazing? So you know what? I need to email this person your um, Zoom meeting information. Is it on your website? Okay. Well, that's what I'll do then. And she will go. She can go to that and she'll probably really like it because um, she, she's just – you know, she just reached out and says, is there any? I said, well, there's these two groups I know, know of. Oh, yeah, but there's also that one now in Canada that started up. And uh, we were talking about that a little bit before we started recording, that your group started, and then there's a group in Kansas, and now this group in Canada. Right. I actually have the website here. Let me look at it. So we have a secular al step study workshop, Mondays, 3 p.m. Pacific time. The Boise Secular al on Wednesday, 7.30 Mountain Time. Any Faith or None, 12 noon Central Time. And then there's an in-person meeting in Newton Falls, Ohio. So that's my the website with Rivenwood Books in it. So if you send her there, we're hoping that people can find a time that works for them. Yeah, well, it's it's good that it's good that it's good that we have that resource, you know. Uh, but prior prior to all of this, uh, she wouldn't have had anywhere to go, probably. 
Right. That's why the demographic is so dispersed because people have tried and given up and tried and given up. And now maybe we're getting some momentum. It's been an interesting conversation. I'm, I'm glad that things have worked out well for your group. It'll be so interesting to see how everything will develop when we do eventually come out of our homes and go back to meeting in person and how all these people being um, experiencing secular meetings, how they're going to react when they go back to their home groups, you know, Uh, it's going to be very interesting. And also it'll be interesting to see if, if Al-Anon itself becomes any, any more open to um, secular groups. And, you know, when I first, when I first heard about their, their um, not being open to them, it kind of surprised me because Al-Anon is pretty good about, from my understanding about updating their literature, unlike AA, don't they have more updated literature when it comes to the program? Yeah, but AA keeps coming out with new literature also. Like the, well, not well. The, the it's the thing about AA though. It's the big book that that is like written in stone. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, the Bible. Of, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's yeah. what everybody clings to. Um, I don't know. They don't. I mean, they had then they had living sober. So I mean, I mean. Are you being like individual AA members that come out with books? That's a lot of that going on. You're talking about just a general service conference. Well, I, I was I was thinking. So then there was, as Bill sees it, and more recently, um, the Grapevine published w- one big tent. The the Grapevine has really gotten on board. So, um, well, I don't think we need to compare the two organizations. It, it surprised you that Al-Anon had a problem. You know, I think it didn't used to have as, well, maybe I shouldn't say this, that the more, the more that nun box gets checked, the more certain evangelical elements uh, rev up their efforts to get Christianity everywhere. And, I don't know uh, what all goes into this decision of the conference to not list meetings with atheist, agnostic, secular, anything that would attract people like the, the people who need it. Um, I don't know what goes into that. I don't know what the rationale is for it. It probably doesn't really matter anyway. I mean, um, things will happen and develop on their own anyway. So, And that's what's, that's what's going on now. Anyway, really, really interesting conversation. Is there anything that we should touch on that that I that I missed? Anyone who has thought about or thinks they might want to start a secular Al-Anon meeting now is an excellent time to do it. Now, when everyone is looking to Zoom, it's easy. You don't have to find a space. That was always the hardest part of starting yeah. a new meeting is finding a place to meet. It's easy now, and there are a bunch of us out there. So now is the time. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, so I'll link uh, I'll link to your website um, when we po- post the podcast. That way people can get in touch with you who might want to start meetings. That'd be nice to see. Great. Great. All right. Well, thanks. Thank Cheers. you so much. Well, that's it. That's another episode of AA Beyond Belief, the podcast. Thank you so much for listening. If you'd like to help out our website and podcast, there's a couple of ways you can do that. First of all, head on over to patreon.com slash AA Beyond Belief and become a patron of our podcast. Uh, I've recently updated some of the benefits for patrons, uh, so you might want to check that out. You can also donate through PayPal at paypal.me slash AA Beyond Belief, or just head on over to our website aabeyondbelief.org and click on the donate button. We'll be back again real soon with another episode. So until then, you all take care, be well. We'll talk again soon.